Thing. So I'm, I'm going to be uh, anchoring the seminar and the webinar on behalf of our colleagues. I'm Bhaskar Vira at the University of Cambridge. Uh, sitting with me is... Hello, I'm Yudit Shlaita, and your Chancellor of the Geography Department here in Cambridge. And um, I'm David Smith, and I work on the UNDP UN Environment Poverty Environment Initiative based in, in Nairobi. And my name is Maria Schaafsma. I work at the University of Southampton in the Department of Geography and Environment. That's great. Thank you. Um, maybe we can switch to the slides at this point. Great. So welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us at this, uh, at this webinar. Um, this is uh, based on output from some work that has been supported by the ESPA program, the Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation program. We've also had some generous support from the ESRC's Global Challenges Research Fund. They have a secondary data analysis initiative, as well as from the Poverty Environment Initiative, which is a combination of UNDP and UN Environment. So with those acknowledgments, um, maybe I want to just move on to uh, tell you a little bit about the structure of the seminar as well as um, how we're going to conduct it. So we've got about half an hour for the two parts of this uh, webinar. We'll present some of our um, method methods and key findings in the first half hour, and there will be half an hour for people to join in with the conversation and the discussion. But given the way that the webinar is structured, you can start typing in questions right away, and you can start typing in your thoughts about challenges in relation to some of the issues we're talking about as well as challenges of implementation. So if you could start using that uh, in real time, rather than waiting till the end of the webinar, then we might have a stack of questions and a conversation to, to get on with. Um, we structured the presentation into sort of five parts. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a background in terms of the context. Judith will take over and tell you a little bit about the theoretical as well as the practical issues that we've confronted in the context of trying to implement some of these ideas. Mariah will report on some uh, field engagement that we've done to, to test the social legitimacy of some of these approaches. I'll hand over eventually to David Smith, who will talk a little bit about the policy relevance and use before coming back for questions. Just in terms of background and context, so the observations that lie behind this work are really structured around uh, a growing understanding of poverty. Uh, and recognizing that the ways in which both poverty and well-being are understood conceptually uh, are diverse, uh, reflect uh, different sorts of country as well as cultural contexts, and we are increasingly sensitive to those diversities of views of the poverty and well-being uh, concepts. There's also been a growing acceptance that poverty goes beyond income poverty, that it is a multidimensional concept, that it needs to have measures that reflect that multidimensionality. Um, linking to that is uh, a further observation that in that multidimensionality, at least in the formal multidimensional poverty measures that have been developed so far, uh, and I include within this the human development indices, the multidimensional poverty indicators that are being developed by the Oxford Poverty Institute, the presence of the environment is somewhat uh, underrepresented. The, the environment, in some senses, is seen outside of that core definition of poverty. Although we observe that people's well-being in poverty, and this is what 10 years of the ESPA program, for example, has been focused on, people's well-being in poverty are tightly linked to the environment. So what we're trying to explore is how can the environment be better connected into the core ways in which we think about poverty and well-being. Uh, at the moment, much of what we focus on neglects that role, and the environment is often treated by people in the mainstream poverty industry as something which is um, disconnected from the pressing issues that they deal with. So ESPA research, research from pre-ESPA days, has demonstrated the tight interlinkages between people's lives and the environment. Um, Judith will explore some of that in more detail, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the many ways in which those interconnections have been, have been documented and what we might then do with them in a sort of 
context in which we're trying to implement a new measure of multidimensional poverty. Just in terms of framing, there's one other important way to sort of understand the frameworks that we're working from. Of course, people are now um, familiar with the global goals, the sustainable development goals. What's interesting, of course, is that the environment is visible in several of these goals, and we can focus in on, on goals 14 and 15, which are seen as the core environmental goals, but also goals to do with clean water, for example, goals to do with sustainable production and consumption. There are a number of goals which are seen to be relevant to the environment. Where we are focusing, in fact, is on goal one. And the targets for goal one have interestingly specifically made mention, firstly, to access to land and natural resources, that's target 1.4, and then building the resilience of the poor, in particular exposure and vulnerability to climate-related extreme events, as well as environmental shocks and disasters. So the poverty goal, goal one, actually now explicitly talks about targets which are environmental. And what we're trying to say is that the indicators for measuring poverty, therefore, need to reflect these environmental dimensions of poverty. And really what the work we've been trying to do is to explore how that might be done in practice, but also is there a theoretical basis to do so. So I'll hand over to Judith for the next section. Uh, thank you, Baska. So as Baska highlighted, there's clearly very tight and complex links between the environment on one hand and poverty and human well-being on the other. And we first started this work by taking a more taking a step back and thinking about more fundamentally how can you conceptualize the link between the environment and poverty. And so on a fundamental level, basically in a very simplistic way, you can think of this relationship in three different ways. First, you can think that the concept environment and poverty don't really influence one another. Then the second option or possibility is that the environment plays a role, an external driving role. So it influences measures and experiences of poverty. And what, that's what we've uh, also called a determinant role. So for example, um, as I mentioned on the slide, air pollution might be affecting people's health, which in turn impact their lives in many different ways of whether they can go to work, whether they can um, um, where the children can flourish in, in the way that they normally would. So it clearly has impact in people's lives in many ways, but from that perspective, the, the natural environment is seen as an external driving force. But then there's a third option whereby the environment uh, is actually, in the way it is experienced, it's actually part of how poverty in itself is understood and experienced. So whereby the environment is part of how people define poverty, or what you might call a constitutive element. Whereas the first aspect, the external instrumental role, has been relatively well reflected in the literature, the uh, more fundamental or internal way in which the environment can be experienced in people's lives, while it is mentioned in the literature, it's not really accounted for in the way poverty is measured or talked about. And so what we wanted to know is if there's these different ways of, ex of experiencing um, the environment in terms of poverty and well-being, is that diversity of ways, is that reflected in current and contemporary philosophic accounts? as well as key existing conceptual frameworks of poverty and well-being? And what are the, some of the political and practical implications? So in this part of the work, we basically reviewed key conceptual frameworks and philosophic accounts. And what we found is that, yes, the environment can be seen and be considered part of poverty, so as an internal or constitutive element, of concepts of well-being and poverty, at least in some contexts. And but what are the aspects of the environment matter that in that respect? Three things that we highlighted in particularly or came across were on one hand the way that the environment or nature is experienced, so a sense of belonging and rootedness, but also the access to natural spaces and resources can have a fundamental impact on people's lives. 
And thirdly, environmental risks and vulnerabilities. So experiencing, for example, severe droughts and floods, landslides, puts people at risks in their lives to, to a degree where the environment has a fundamental role in their, in their lives. And you can find uh, more detail of this work in the publication mentioned there. Then it also raises the question of, if you can think of the environment in these, in these different ways, is that currently captured in the way we measure poverty? And we wanted to see, using secondary data in the case of Brazil, could you include some of these environmental aspects into a multidimensional index of poverty? And part of this work, we reviewed different data sets to make sure that, that what we are trying to integrate is relevant in the specific context of Brazil. And uh, as I said, we wanted to do this at the national level, so we needed national data sets that are appropriate in scale and time. The one specific measure of multidimensional poverty, the multidimensional poverty index, which we build on this work, is one of the measures that is being used in Brazil alongside a number of others, for example, also poverty line. But the MPI, the multidimensional poverty index, comprises three specific dimensions in its measure, being health, education, and living standards. And we started using that as it's been adapted specifically to Brazil. And these list the um, indicators that are included currently in the MPI version adapted to Brazil, which we used as a basis of this work. And when you map this to the municipality level, here shown for 2000-2010, you can see quite dramatic changes in which multidimensional poverty, as considered in this sense, changes as you, and this reflects national census data um, from 2000-2010. So we wanted to see how could we integrate some of the environmental considerations in this multidimensional poverty index. And as I mentioned earlier, the environment can influence, obviously, all these different aspects of a mentioned dimension of poverty. So the environment could in in directly influence health, education, living standards. But there's also aspects of the environment which could be part of how poverty is perceived directly. So we wanted to include some of, wanted to see if we could include some of these aspects within the measure itself. And this table summarizes some of the thinking that we went through um, to see what are the, on one hand, the three dimensions I mentioned earlier, that is the experience of the existence of nature, access to natural resources, as well as environmental risks and vulnerability. And what are the indicators that were thought of being particularly relevant in the Brazilian context, and what are the, some of the appropriate data sets? But I should also say, we, in order to think through these different aspects, we, we had a workshop in Brazil, and we also worked together with a partner organization based in Rio, the International Institute of Sustainability, which may, meant that we could tap into uh, people's expertise from different backgrounds and discuss some of these issues in the context of Brazil to come up with the indicators and also some of the data sets that exist both at national, regional, and global level. And I, I guess it comes at no surprise that there, is, there are data sets that are relevant for measuring some of the indicators, but for others it's very difficult to get appropriate indicators. So for example, for the spiritual connection with nature and the sense of belonging routineness, of, that is very difficult to capture at a, um, in a quantitative way and, and and even more difficult to get data at a national level. So for some of these indicators, we couldn't find any data sets. For some of them, we could find data sets, but they captured only, they captured more the instrumental um, role of the environment. So 
that uh, at the end, the ones we um, the the ones we ended up focusing on, and we had appropriate data for are the ones highlighted here: access to natural vegetation, exposure to floods and droughts, as well as landslides. So. Those are the indicators and data sets we then included within the multi-dimensional poverty index. And this, these are some of our preliminary findings of this work, which we are still working through, which shows basically this, the NPI adjusted for the environment on the right-hand side, and the NPI, as I showed it earlier, just comprising the initial three dimensions on the left-hand side, the top two figures showing the data for 2000 and the bottom for 2010. And what you see is in, in both cases, so in the adjusted and in the unadjusted index, poverty reduces quite remarkably between 2000 and 2010. But interestingly, if you include the environment, the effect is differential between 2000 and 2010, whereas in 2000, the environment has a sort of mitigating influence um, as overall mean poverty decreases compared to the unadjusted index, it becomes more acute in 2010, which is due to increasing environmental pressures between those years. So I hope that this has shown that, yes, it is possible to increase um, some environmental dimensions that are relevant for poverty within the multidimensional poverty index itself. Um, and you can go some way with some of the existing secondary data sets that already exist. But there's clearly other aspects that are very difficult to capture at such a course, relatively coarse and national level, which also highlights the importance of um, linking it to work um, with at the local level to understand local perceptions about what how people understand their life. And uh, that leads me on to handing over to Mariah. Thank you, Judith. Um, I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, so yes, indeed, uh, one important aspect of measuring poverty is to make sure that you're measuring those aspects of poverty that matter to, to those people whose well-being is being measured. And as Vasquez said, well-being is understood in many different ways, and really what makes us feel well um, depends on cultural norms, on history, on opportunities, relative wealth. Um, so in that sense, um, Nicole Grosskamp and I were tasked to develop a study methodology that would help understand the role of the natural environment in well-being um, according to the people whose poverty is, is measured in two countries, Rwanda and Malawi. And both countries experience high levels of poverty. They are um, a lot smaller than Brazil, but um, they are and they are landlocked. They had or used to, or they have or used to have um, vast tracts of forest that supported wildlife, and most people for their livelihood depend on agriculture or fisheries. However, um, due to a combination of, of, of factors, including deforestation and climate change, um, floods and droughts, as you see on the, on the pictures on the right, um, are having an increasingly devastating effect. And there's really no infrastructure in place to protect people against such nat natural hazards and disasters. So, um, Nicole and I developed um, a protocol for focus group discussions that can help practitioners identify relevant environmental factors and their role in human well being. And in the field, we went to different types of villages and basically first asked the, uh, people to brainstorm about what a good life meant to them. And then we linked what they mentioned to a set of uh, well-being categories that we based from the international literature uh, on this topic that um, Basca also um, referred to. And participants then deliberated about the various environmental aspects of what these well-being categories and then finally ranked uh, the dimensions to their, um, according to the importance to their well-being. 
And I just want to show you some of the um, stories that people um, told us. And I guess some of these stories um, may not necessarily come as a surprise to, to those of you who work in the field and who are practitioners, um, but they still show the, the hardship that people exposed to natural hazards and to unjust um, resource government um, are experiencing. So in one of the villages um, that had just, uh, they had, people had just experienced the flood and they said, well, the, the floods destroyed our crops and our belongings and um, they were evacuated, uh, but it was very uncomfortable. Um, they were susceptible to disease outbreaks. They also said um, it was very difficult to live in such a small environment for months. Um, so they were very concerned and worried about future floods. In another village the, where people depended mainly on the lake for fisheries, they, the lake had, well, they, had, they were experiencing a severe drought. And they said, we're extremely, extremely worried about a drought. We depend on the lake. We don't know where to go. And not only fishermen were affected, but also farmers. Shops are closed. There was no um, activity in the village at that point in time at all. Um, in forest uh, villages, the stories were equally harsh, and, but those were more, more about governance. So in one location, the women told us, well, we're not allowed to access the forest. And now we have no firewood for cooking, no income, no grass for thatching our houses. And the increased um, protection of the forest included a risk for women as well. And they told us, one of the women told us, I was beaten when soldiers found me in the forest. And some of us have actually been sexually harassed by soldiers. The men um, in another village were responsible for protecting and for guarding their fields. And he said, yes, the forests are good for wildlife, but we don't appreciate them much because they destroy our crops, especially monkeys and wild pigs. So throughout the different focus group discussions that we had, we, there were a few um, key empirical findings that we want to highlight here. So in these rural settings in Rwanda and Malawi that we went to, degradation of the environment leads to a range of well-being changes, and most of them are negative. When we talk about severe environmental degradation and natural hazards, they negatively affect people's psychological well-being, and people express a sense of, a sense of fear, um, stress, sometimes depression. Having access to and control over environmental and natural resources contributes to freedom of choice and um, an idea of autonomy and um, also a, a sense of security in some, in some cases. So based on the interaction that we had in these, for, at least for these particular study sites, we concluded that including environmental factors in poverty measures appears to be socially legitimate. So the final question is then, how, well, how would you operationalize this? Um, this is a figure that, that, that Judith showed before. Um, so our research suggests, first of all, that looking at these correlations or say the, um, the, the external role of the environment and how it affects our health or our education or living standards remains important. Um, but we could also look into the contribution of the environment to these existing factors. Um, for example, for the health uh, dimension, we could assess what the contribution of the natural environment is to food production. Um, and there is a number of data sources that you could use, such as food diaries, household surveys, production data, forest collection data. Um, another thing you could look at would be to see what, to what extent people suffer from vector-borne diseases and the role of the environment there. And people have done already, studies already on using health facility data um, to assess that. For living standards, interestingly, um, rather than assessing specific types of sanitation, what we found in the field was that 
but that um, dimension wasn't meaningful to people. Instead, they cared more about fuel, drinking water, and housing. So it would be relevant to look at the contribution of natural resources to those factors. Um, and such data could be collected again using household survey data. Um, but I guess the, the, most, the, the most important change that, we, that results from our study um, in Rwanda and Malawi um, as well is what Judith also covered in her presentation, the role of the natural environment internally, internal or inherent in poverty. And again, two, um, two dimensions came to the fore. One would be control over and access to natural resources. And what we argue there is that such data should really be collected using household survey data. And existing GIS maps may just not be reliable enough. The second dimension would be the exposure to very high risks of or very high impact events of natural hazards and climate change. Um, that really lead to the sense of uh, stress and emergency that people talked about and psychological impacts. And there, secondary data is available. And um, for example, the future floods or drought risks could be used. Um, I hope that that has given a bit of an idea of how we see um, to how these poverty environment linkages could be operationalized. Let me switch to David, um, who will say more about policy relevance and use. Okay, thank you, Mariah. Well, I'm going to say a few words to highlight the, the policy relevance and, and use of, of, of the kind of work that has been described by um, uh, the other presenters. Right, if we define environment as including natural resources, so we're talking about environment and natural resources, then the issue of including environment in multi-dimensional poverty measurement is, is highly relevant in most countries in Africa because they are highly dependent on environment and natural resources. And if we use these unsustainably, then the social and economic benefits generated from the result, uh, result environment natural resources decline. So in other words, it's relevant because in a lot of countries, unsustainable use inhibits the achievement of development objectives such as poverty reduction and food security. So this, this is well recognized by most governments now. So what governments are asking is for practical methodologies to measure and monitor environment poverty linkages. For example, the government in Rwanda requested that we provide support to develop a methodology to include environment in poverty uh, monitoring that they can integrate into their national development plan monitoring. It's also relevant because there's increasing recognition that we can't adequately eradicate, eliminate poverty by simply relying on GDP growth. We have to have target, we have to better target policies, programs, projects at poverty um, reduction. And to do that, we must have better ways of measuring poverty and in our context measuring poverty environment linkages because you know if we can't measure it we can't target it so <clears throat> we the UN the Cambridge different universities have been working together to try and develop practical methodologies of integrating environment into multi-dimensional poverty uh, measure we've still got a ways to go yet and we have to recognize that countries are, are very different so um, we need to have uh, target methodologies that can be adapted and applied according to specific um, country needs and there are some major challenges there's the challenge of we need to do more work to develop practical methodologies 
But even when we've done that, there are major challenges in terms of capacity and data availability. There's institutional and individual capacity issues. When we say institutional, that means the, the, the design and the mechanisms of approaches and tools used by institutions. And data availability is a major challenge as well. So it's, it's a challenge, for example, in terms of we need more disaggregated data. We need to have it uh, gender disaggregated. We need to have data at local community and district level, and it needs to be at sufficient resolution. And some of the poverty environment linkages, we can't practically collect the, the necessary data through household surveys. So we need to combine household survey data with secondary data sets. And yes, it is quite challenging, but in the context of the SDGs, this is work that has to be done, really, to help governments um, better monitor uh, envir poverty environment linkages within the context of the achievement of SDGs and uh, national development goals in general. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. And um, I'll just try and draw um, our presentation to a quick conclusion before we move over. And I can see a number of questions already coming in. Uh, so keep those flowing, please. Um, so just to quickly summarize where we are, um, we started from a sort of recognition that current poverty measures seem not to be doing an adequate job of capturing the role of the natural environment in terms of our understanding of poverty and well-being. Um, our review of both the theoretical literature, conceptual frameworks, as well as a philosophical basis suggested that we could at least in some places theoretically justify an approach that does seek to incorporate the environment into poverty measures. Um, a very preliminary work in the field suggests that it's socially legitimate. Uh, we have been exploring the political feasibility, uh, especially through conversations and workshops facilitated by the Poverty Environment Initiative. And it suggests that there is certainly some appetite in some countries and in some local contexts to try and have a broader measure which does include the environment. And uh, increasingly, countries seem to be looking for such measures. Um, our exploratory work with the Brazilian data sets reveals both that it is possible to get an adjusted index, and we showed some of our preliminary findings. But there are also limitations, because existing secondary data actually doesn't necessarily capture so many of the elements that we think might be important influence pathways between the environment and poverty and well-being. So the data sets are limited in what we can do with them. Um, within the context of the SDGs, and in particular returning back to the fact that SDG 1 now does include the environment uh, explicitly as a target, uh, we clearly need better poverty indicators for measuring progress towards SDG 1. So I think the wider influence of what we're trying to do is to try and develop uh, stronger indicators that can demonstrate progress towards the achievement of SDG, uh, the SDGs more generally, but SDG 1 in particular in terms of measuring poverty and well-being. Uh, let me stop our presentation at that point and start uh, the conversation. I want to start with a set of questions, uh, if I can direct them to Mariah, because there, there are a set of questions coming in uh, from Julie, from Jorge, um, from Patrick, which are specific to the work that we did in Malawi and Rwanda. So I, I wonder, Mariah, would you mind just responding to that set of questions first? And those should, those should all be visible, but in case people can't see them, uh, Julie is asking, in the focus groups, did you refer to an existing set of well-being dimensions, or did you consider those aspects mentioned? By the participants. Um, we've got a question from Jorge, which is, could you find any relevant environmental indicator related to the educational dimension of the MPI 
Um, Patrick is asking, what was the basis of selecting the focus groups in Rwanda? And then another question from Julie about sure, no uh, problem. And, whether we uh, thank you observed all very much a decoupling between well-being. Um, which allow me to clarify some of the work that we did. Um, so in response to Julie's question about um, whether we used existing dimensions or only those that people mentioned um, in the bottom-up part of the, um, uh, of the focus group. So um, what we did is that we first did a brainstorm about and basically asked people what, is, what does well-being mean to you, um, what makes you feel better off or worse off than other people in your village or in neighbouring villages, um, etc, etc. So there were different types of lists that we created. We then match them onto a set of dimensions, I think it was 10 or 11, that um, we extracted from the literature. The, we didn't identify any new categories as such, um, but not always the same things were mentioned across the focus groups. Um, and in sub the subsequent sort of ranking exercise, we used our existing, um, the existing uh, dimensions. The, in response to Jorge about, um, I hope this, this answers um, that first question. Um, in response to Jorge and education, I, I can only talk from Malawi because Nicole went to Rwanda. So, um, but I remember that in, in Malawi there was one participant who said, actually I find it um, a real problematic and a real loss that uh, my children will no longer be able to see monkeys um, and, and, and different wildlife that we used to see um, as kids in neighbouring forests. But this was only one participant, it didn't come up in other discussions. Um, the impact of, uh, the indirect impact of environmental degradation on education and enrolment or participation of children in schooling didn't come up necessarily either. But it was mentioned that if we lose natural resources, we lose income, and there, therefore we won't be able to pay for our children's school fees, for example. Um, the next question um, from Patrick about the choice of locations, um, particularly in Rwanda, but um, we had, this was a small project, um, we went to four villages in each country, and the selection of villages was based on um, both ecosystem type and ecosystem quality. So we went in both countries, we went to a forest, a forest location and then a water-based location, so near a lake. Those aren't perfectly se separable because often there is um, a forest near a lake, or etc. Um, and then we went to um, a location with um, a good quality river system or lake system and low quality lakes is more good forest than bad forest, so to say. Um, and in country we worked together with, um, in, in Malawi and in Rwanda, we worked together with people from the Property Environment Initiative and uh, government officials that helped us select study sites. There was a question from Julie again about decoupling and to what extent um, it might be, <laughs> There, is, there was a decoupling of the sense of well-being and then, I suppose, and then um, of poverty. And I think this is a wider issue that we may want to talk about in more generally. Um, there were, I mean, if, if you, it depends on how you would explain decoupling, I suppose. Um, but in general, um, in the places that we went to, um, people did feel a connection with the location where they were living. Um, we asked them questions around what would you miss if you were no longer able to live here and they would express a sense of, you know, um, say, say things that would just kind of express the sense of belonging. Um, that was, and, and that could relate to particular um, cultural, spiritual connections to that location or the, the way they interacted, the, the way they, they, they lived their lives as a farmer or as a fisherman. Those weren't necessarily the most prominent answers that we got. 
Um, and in the ranking and um, exercise where we try to assess the importance of such a dimension, that was often ranked quite low. Um, I would say, though, that that might be particular to Malawi and Rwanda. And I'd like to re-emphasize that what we are trying to do here is to develop a protocol that could be used elsewhere where such dimensions may be more important. Um, and then finally, um, in response to Jorge about the sort of conflicting statements about wildlife, um, what the group that participant said was that wildlife um, the forest was important to wildlife. He didn't necessarily express uh, an appreciation of that wildlife in that sense, because actually it did inflict a, a cost on him. Um, you know, farmers had to spend 12 hours a day through, um, throughout uh, the growing season in the field um, to protect their crops, because that's often their only source of income and food for the year. Um, they said that other people tend to appreciate the wildlife more than they did, um, which I guess is one of the reasons why we, we study these issues. Um, so who, you know, who, in, in terms of um, efforts towards to protected area management, for example, who is really benefiting from that, and what are the opportunity costs of, of doing so? Does that cover the questions? Does anybody? Yes. Thank, thanks for that, Maria. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe move us on to some of the other questions that have been coming in, uh, and thank you for your responses. So, uh, just just following on from the last one that you finished on, the, one of the issues that we've been trying to do is to uh, ensure that when we are developing these new indices, we don't uh, double count. By which I mean we don't count things that are already reflected in existing measures. And obviously, if there's a direct impact on agricultural production, for example, through crop losses, one would expect that that would already be reflected negatively in a person's income profile or would be reflected negatively in terms of their overall aggregate indicator of well-being. So while the presence of wildlife might be creating that negative impact, it might already be captured in some of the measures that we've already developed. Um, so we wouldn't want to reflect that both as a negative in the environmental dimension as well as in an in income dimension. And we've been trying very carefully when we've been reviewing our use of data to avoid the possibility of double counting. I want you to sort of maybe take the question around decoupling, which Mariah also referred to, with a question that was asked about uh, our focus being on communities in rural areas. And uh, this is a question from Alma. What are our thoughts on how linking environment and poverty would differ when working with vulnerable communities in urban areas. And I know that when we did our stakeholder meetings in Brazil, this was a question that came up uh, immediately. And it's a way of maybe switching towards some of the Brazilian work. Uh, Yurit, would you want to reflect on that particular question? And then I'll ask you the, another set of questions which are directed toward the Brazilian work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, the, the question on urban versus rural is, is a very important one. And as Baska mentioned, when we had our first uh, workshop in Brazil, it was one of the things that was very prominent in that people felt that their, you know, poverty obviously, they experienced poverty possibly in slightly different ways as uh, certain things matter in urban environment and others in potentially rural. Given that our, our project was aimed to work at the national level, we tried to capture, we tried to use data sets and indicators where that would be relevant for both the rural and the urban environment. But it's certainly important to to not, while, while we are initial analysis has been at the national level, it would be very important to do further work at more, um, at higher resolution levels and, for example, disaggregate the, the urban and the rural environment. And I guess that also links to some of the questions about potential trade-offs where some people might be impacted in a positive way and others in a negative way uh, through the environment. And again, that also depends on the scale of analysis. So it could, it could certainly be possible to include, for example, uh, crop loss or um, risk from, um, you know, the, the perceived negative risks from wildlife as, as posing a risk to one's life. 
as well as the positives, you could, you could include both as indicators. And then depending on the context, they could, uh, overall, it could have a positive or negative impact. So while we didn't go into these details, that's certainly an option to do in, in finer scale analyses, where you include the, the indicators that matter to the localities where you're, you're looking at, and then you know, be able to disaggregate and understand some of these trade-offs better. But it, you know, um, as some of the questions have highlighted, this is clearly a very important issue to take into consideration. And overall, it also highlights that, as Mariah uh, made very clear, we had very um, we had the opportunity to go to only a, a, a few villages, um, but it highlights the importance of really doing more on the ground work to feed into this, to find out what people what really matters to people in terms of environmental considerations in a much more diverse uh, set of settings, in different cultural backgrounds, etc. So I think uh, that's one of the strong takeaway messages also from our research, which has been highlighted in many other research that um, these kind of bottom-up uh, um, understandings are very important. And then I also wanted to, there was a couple of questions about specifics um, on the changes in poverty between 2000 and 2010, and what are the re um, reasons for the reduction. So the main reduction were clearly due to the, um, the social and socioeconomic aspects, so changes in living standards and uh, health. So th that wasn't really a focus of our project. So I'm afraid I can't say what were the what are the underlying reasons for for that re re reduce in poverty um, in poverty in that sense. But in terms of the environmental changes, so the fact that the environmental pressures increased, so that would have been degradation, so a loss of uh, natural habitats, but also potential increases in the risks associated with uh, droughts and landslides, and as those were the measures that we included in our environmental dimension. Um, I think that was what I was going to say right yep. now about the visual data. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm, I'm seeing a set of more general questions coming in, and I'm going to try and combine a, a couple of them. So. Uh, Mike has asked, I think with reference to the sustainable livelihoods framework, that livelihoods approaches have already uh, located natural resources as an asset uh, with practical recognition of the mix of assets as being critical to de determining well-being. Fiona, your question I think is related because this approach does try and differentiate from previous initiatives, including the sustainable livelihoods framework. But uh, you've asked the question, how have we learned from these past initiatives? So the paper that um, you did refer to, which is which came out in Sustainable Development last year, includes within it a review of previous conceptual models that try and combine poverty and environment. That paper is available on our open access. There is a link to it on the website that's linked to this webinar. In case anybody needs it, please uh, feel free to request it and we can send you a copy. Um, we did review previous work. We did try and see the ways in which the previous frameworks uh, look at poverty and environment relationships. And in particular, we focused on whether they make the distinction that we are making between an instrumental relationship and a constitutive relationship. So we are building very much on existing work so far. Um, I'm now beginning to see a set of questions about how we take this forward. So there's a question from Patrick about whether natural capital accounting and valuation could be a way of integrating some of these dimensions. Uh, there's a question from Amaya, which is about whether the relationship of SDG 1 in relation to the environment should be done at country level or should it be agreed and discussed at global level? Um, I'm wondering, David, do you want to respond to a couple of those and in a way to draw you into that conversation? So the specific question, one is, um, what's the value of adopting a sort of natural capital type approach to this and valuation of ecosystems? Uh, and secondly, should yes. the definitions um, okay. be operationalized at country level or should they be at global level? Uh, obviously, sitting at PEI, I you've got they a, do have a role. perspective on this. I, I wonder whether this is a good way these to do this. These are a work in progress, if you like, and that I feel from the experience I've had in, in, the, in the countries that we should try and adapt the existing systems that governments have in, in place 
um, uh, rather than trying to uh, focus too much on a natural capital ecosystem valuation. In other words, try and take an incremental step approach to including environment and multi-dimensional poverty uh, measurement. In terms of the, the SDG question from Amaya, we know that there's, there's internationally agreed um, indicators for the SDGs, for all of the SDGs. For example, in SDG 15, which is about the, the land environment, there's a, an indicator on the proportion of land that is degraded over the, um, total land area. And those indicators can't be changed, but the way they're applied and measured at the country level will vary. And in fact, I believe it should vary according to circumstances. So the definition of uh, land degradation um, will, will may be applied in a different way according to diff uh, different conditions at the country level. So there's enough flexibility in the SDG indicators to be able to one, choose those which are most relevant to the country and then measure it, apply it in a way that will reflect the country's particular circumstances and priorities. Great, thank you, David. Um, I'm, I, I see two questions which I'm going to try and link. Uh, there's one from Tim Doe, which is um, recognizing the case that we're trying to make that um, the two arguments for incorporating nature are both because nature has an intrinsic uh, value in terms of the way we understand well-being, but there's also a very tight instrumental relationship uh, between natural resources, environmental dynamics, and, and people's experienced well-being. And it's important, I think, to conceptually make that distinction, uh, which is sort of what we've been trying to do. Uh, I think Mike's question, Mike Morris at the end, has a question about indigenous peoples and the loss of access to ancestral lands, loss and destruction of habitat, uh, loss of biodiversity and species, and how that impacts on their spiritual well-being. And certainly when we were looking at the Brazilian data sets, the secondary data on this really doesn't give us uh, a very good handle. Um, and I think there's it's clear from the literature, from the philosophical accounts, from the plurality of perspectives that are coming through, for example, even in the work that the IPBES has been doing recently, that these, these factors are important. And in Tim Doe's phrasing would probably be part of the intrinsic value question. So it's really important that we don't neglect these from our understanding of poverty and well-being, because the loss of these cultural assets, these has profound and direct impacts on the way in which people both experience nature and experience the concept of well-being. Secondary data doesn't currently capture this. So we have to find a way of either generating new primary data sets at country level so that we can actually start to capture this in the places where it matters. Um, and that's certainly going to be you know, one of the ways one might want to take this forward. Prior to doing that, I suppose people should and would expect that there is more empirical confirmation that these issues matter in more than the places that we've been so far able to look at. So some of the work that we started doing in Rwanda and Malawi was trying to test how much this matters. And you already start to see variation in the responses you get from different different field locations. So that's certainly future work. We, I, we feel we're at the beginning of a much larger enterprise, but we certainly wanted to share some of this uh, with you for the moment. now. I'm conscious of where we are in terms of time. It's it's about three minutes to one in the UK. Uh, so I think we might need to be drawing our discussion to a close. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for everyone who's participated so far. I just wanted to make a few points. The recording of this webinar will be available on the ESPA website. So uh, please feel free to log back on there if you need to refer back to any of the detail. I know we might have run through some of the slides relatively quickly. 
there is also going to be an associated impact story on that website. And if colleagues um, would like to follow up the conversation privately with any of us, we'd be very happy to deal with further questions and share some of our more detailed findings uh, in due course. Um, Dave, who is at the ESPA Directorate, will who who is coordinating some of the, the outputs will will email colleagues and those who participated when material is available online. Uh, the recording should be done pretty quickly. Uh, I just wondered whether each of us sitting around the table might have one brief comment to conclude. So, Judith, since the microphone is unmuted at our end, why don't you start and then I'll pass over to Mariah next and then David. Yeah, um, I guess for me, what I've already highlighted earlier, I think it's important to do more on the ground work with, in different contexts to understand um, a more diverse set of views about the relationship between nature and human well-being. And I think one of the points that uh, Tim also raised in his question at the end, that making also a difference between processes and outcomes, because they're clearly very important. And at the moment, in, in the indicators we have, we are capturing only a very small part of the ways in which uh, nature matters to people are mainly um, and to follow up on that I think indeed so so what is missing is what is water and ecosystem services literature probably is being referred to as cultural ecosystem services um, that could require more work I think it's an important question here what is relevant um, and what is what is feasible as well because I think we're trying to find this balance between okay what is what is the robust way of, uh, and the reliable way and the socially legitimate way of doing things and then what, what is you know where how how fast can we respond to political demand and what is the demand and where, where is that targeted to so that finding that balance is a tricky one and it requires some more discussion i think one other thing that i'd like to mention is that identifying these dimensions and identifying the factors is important but we within the project also have had lots of discussion about okay um what within within that di environmental dimension what is then the threshold when would you be considered poor um and when are you no longer poor what is sufficient environmental quality for you or you know insufficient um so i think that's also a discussion that should not cannot be held only within um at, at high level, but it should also be discussed at, at, at local level. Um, and again, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that, from my experience, is a, a, a substantive demand for this kind of work in the countries that that we we work in, and that. We have a, a role, a responsibility, if you like, as the international community to help countries like Mozambique, Malawi, and Rwanda to, with practical methodologies for measuring environment poverty uh, linkages in a manner that is sufficiently flexible for them to apply it within the context of their national development um, priorities and also within the context of, of the SDGs. So we've got quite a bit of work to do to, to meet this demand. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone for joining the webinar.